much. Turning your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We'll continue our thoughts about joy, and today's lesson is how to be joyful no matter what. You know, there are so many people that don't enjoy life at all. They just endure life. Go out to the mall, go out to the airport, wherever, the, where you know there's a crowd of people, and, and just say, I'm a people watcher. Do you, do you watch people? When I'm out, I like to watch people. And you look out, and, and you see these glum faces. People look like they have heavy hearts, like they're just not enjoying life at all. Sometimes when I look out from the pulpit up here, I, I see some people that look like basset hounds. You know, you got the <laughs> droopy eyes and a droopy mouth. Uh, if they're Christians, they must have been baptized in vinegar, you know. <laughs> Maybe they were born on the dark side of the moon weaned on a dill, dill pickle, you know. Christians ought to be the happiest, most joyous people in the world, amen. I mean, we're children of the king. A and our inheritance... Is, is everything. Uh, when I was up in Alabama, uh, this lady gave me a pillow and embroidered or, or cross stitch, whatever it is. I'm not sure what it is. But it says, preachers don't make very much, but their retirement program is out of this world. <laughs> uh, and, and that's right. But that's for all, and not just preachers, that's all Christians. Our retirement program is out of this world. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. But you know, the problem is, and I think some Christians get involved in this, is that they think that we have to have a perfect life in order for us to be happy. If I could just change my situation, then I, I would be all right. It would be great. If I could just get rid of all my problems, then I could be joyous. If you learn if you're going to learn to be joyful, you have to do it now in your situation, whatever that situation is. You know, the word happy comes from the word happenstance. And that's from the same word that we get the word circumstance. You see what that means? That happiness depends on happenings. And so that means happy, happy comes from external things, but joy, the joy that God wants us to have, the joy that Jesus prayed that we would have comes from within. It comes from a, a, a willing spirit of service and love for God. Now, we talked about how to be happy in spite of people. Today, we want to talk about how to be happy in spite of circumstances or problems. Now, the background for our lesson is that, that Paul, for the last four plus years, has been miserable in his circumstances. First of all, he spent two years in jail in Caesarea on trumped up charges. Then he's put on a ship to go to, to Rome. Uh, he's in a, a terrible storm. They shipwrecked. They finally wash up on shore. He's bitten by a poisonous snake. He has to spend the winter on this island. Then he finally goes to Rome, and now he's in Rome, and he spends two more years in prison. And during this two-year uh, prison term in Rome, he's chained to a guard 24 hours a day in four-hour shifts. And yet Paul writes in Philippians 1 and 18, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Okay, Paul, I got a question for you. What's your secret? I mean, that's not exactly happy circumstances that you're living in. How do you stay so positive in prison? How you, do you delight in your difficulties? How do you stay up when things have not turned out the way you wanted them to turn out? Well, I think in this first chapter of Philippians, Paul gives us four secrets to joyful living, no matter what. And that's what we're going to talk about. So first of all, if I want to be joyful no matter what, I need a perspective to live from. Look at verse 12. we we'll read through verse 14. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, 
it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my change, most of the brothers of, of the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So you see, it's not important that you have problems, but it's important that how you look at, at those problems. Paul says, look, I, I want you to know that what's happening to me has really served to advance the gospel. He was looking on the positive side. He was looking from a different perspective than most people would. He was looking from God's perspective. Pa Paul was able to see the best even in the worst of circumstances. You know, he wanted to go to Rome, but he, and now he's getting to go at the government's expense. That's a good way to look at it, you know. Uh, he wanted to go preach in Rome, and, and now he's getting to preach, although he is chained to a guard uh, 24 hours a day. Think about that now. For two hours, I mean for two years, four hours, every four hours a different guard comes and is chained to him. That's 4,380 times that Paul shared the gospel. And he saw that. He knew he had this purpose. He looked at it from that perspective. Now, how many guards was that? I don't know, but four, every four hours, that's six a day. And I'm sure, though, that some of the guards did it more than one day, more than one time. So it must, must have been hundreds of guards that he witnessed to that he shared the gospel with. If you look over at chapter 4 and verse 22, uh, the, uh, there it says that uh, a lot of the family uh, of, the, of Nero became Christian. Nero's family became Christians. And history tells us that Nero had his wife, his mother, and his children, some of his children, killed because they became believers. How did they become believers? Because of Paul. He was chained to these guards, and some of these guards are the future leaders of Rome. I call that a chained reaction. Uh, he was preaching the gospel, and he had a captive audience, sort of like I've got you, a captive audience. We're not chained together, but you're here, and you know you can't leave till I finish. And so that was what Paul was. He had these people, and he had them for four hours. They weren't knew where they could go. And so he told them about Jesus Christ. So you see, when I face problems joyously, it presents golden opportunities for service to God and others. Last, uh, we were talking about Paul talking to the guards. That was opportunities. And that's what Howard was trying to tell us all this weekend, is that we we must, every one of us, must take advantage of every opportunity. And, and we may not know everything. As a matter of fact, none of us know everything, but we know how we became Christians, and we know what a happy and joyous time we have here around our worship. Just ask them. Just talk to them. Last Sunday, uh, Mother's Day, I took Kathy down to, to Chili's. Uh, she had a, a coupon for a free dessert because it was her birthday uh, that week. And so she wanted to go to Chili's. Uh, she also wanted to go to Chili's because they don't charge more on Mother's Day. She refuses to, to go to a restaurant that charges more on Mother's Day. She says, I do not eat more on Mother's Day than I do any other day. And, and so we went to Chili's. And, uh, and so this young man did what a good waiter does. He wished her a happy Mother's Day and said, have you had a good day? And she said, yes, I've had a good day. I went to church and got a rose. And, uh, and he said, well, that's, that's nice. You know, my girlfriend took me to church for the first time uh, this, this past week, and I really liked it. And I said, well, you mean you didn't go to church when you were a young? He said, well, when I was really young, but he said, I don't remember much about it. But he said, I really enjoyed it. And so then Kathy said, well, he's the preacher where I went today. And, and so we got to talking, and, and I said, why don't you come and worship with us? And he said, well, I'll, I'll talk to my girlfriend, but he said, do you have Wednesday night services? Because I have to work a lot of Sundays, and I can't always come. 
And so I described to him the class that I was teaching on Christian living about getting a grasp on the Bible and, and we're going to be talking about prayer and, and, and fellowship and, and some other things about Christian living. And, and he said, I'd, I'd really like to hear that. And so I gave him my card. Now, I don't know if that young man will come or not, but I took advantage of an opportunity. That's what, that's what Paul was doing, and that's what we need to do. And that means we're looking at life not from what our problems are shoving at us, but we're looking at it from the perspective of God and eternity. And so that's what we need to be involved in. If we're going to be happy, if we're going to be joyous, we have to do it. And so if I, if I face my problems joyfully, it's going to present some opportunities for me to serve God and to serve my fellow man. But also, when I face problems joyfully, it will encourage other people. Uh, look at verse 14 again. He said, Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You see, Paul was an encourager. And so when he encouraged the brothers, then they were able to speak the word more boldly because Paul was bold. Do you, you know where courage comes from? I think it comes from enthusiasm. And you know the Greek word that's translated into English enthusiasm is entheos, which actually means God within us. Enthusiasm comes from God and courage emanates from enthusiasm. Uh, and so uh, enth I heard a preacher say one time that enthusiasm is as contagious as measles and as powerful as dynamite. And that's right. And that's emanates then courage from that. We have the courage to be bold. Paul said that we need to understand in Romans 8 and 28 that all things work together for good for those who are called according to, the, to uh, his purpose. And so here's the lesson. God has a purpose behind all my problems. And when I get that perspective, then I'm going to be happy. I'm going to have joyful living. Now, you, you see in the, in the thing today, in the bulletin, uh, and, and I appreciate the prayer uh, by Richard, uh, I've got cancer. But you know, the way I'm looking at that is, is that this is an opportunity. Uh, I, I'm not happy that I've got cancer. I'm not happy that I'm going to have to have surgery. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm a little bit irritated. It's going to interrupt my golf game, you know. Uh, but I'm going to have to give up time of three of my favorite things, my family, my church, and my God. But anyway, uh, the way I'm looking at it is, what opportunity is God going to give me? I know that he has a purpose for my problem. There's going to be somebody that I can share the gospel with. There's going to be somebody that I can witness to, or there's going to be somebody I can encourage who has a, has a heart disease. But see, I, I'm anticipating with joy how is God going to use me in this opportunity? I know he is. And so uh, I have that perspective and I, I want that perspective and I want that perspective for you. If you want to live a joyful life, live it from God's perspective. God has a purpose behind all my problems and that's the perspective I'm going to live from. And I will rejoice just as Paul rejoiced. But if I'm going to enjoy life and be joyful no matter what, I also need a priority to live by. Look at verse uh, 15. Pro uh, yeah, verse 15. It is true that some preach out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives of truth, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I continue to rejoice. You see, I will either live my life based on problems or I'll live it based on my priorities. You're going to decide what your priorities are 
or somebody else will decide what they are for you. So you need to decide what your priorities are. If you, if you don't choose your priorities, then what you're going to be doing is living your life and going around putting out fire after fire after fire rather than living it from, uh, from the standpoint of God ruling your life. You're, now, in these verses that I read, it says Paul is being criticized while he's in prison. And criticism is something that can steal your joy. It is a kill joy, isn't it? But Paul didn't let it kill his joy. Paul's response was, what does it matter? The important thing is, the gospel's being preached. I, he was saying their methods or their ideas or the way they do it may not be mine, but they're preaching the gospel. I rejoice about that. And, and that's what the way we ought to, ought to be. Paul says, I'm not going to allow circumstances to steal my joy. I'm not going to let critics steal my joy. He says, I'm going to allow nothing to upset my values and to upset my priorities. How many arguments do you have in your marriage that are over things that don't really matter? Is it worth losing your joy over? Think about that. If you want to keep your joy, then you have to have a perspective to live from and you have to have a priority to live by. So what priority should I live by? I suggest to you Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. In everything you do, put God first and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. That's what it's all about, friends. That's, that is what really counts. Put God first. Don't worry about the non-essentials in life. And, and listen to me. This church is not in comp competition with anybody else. We ought to be praising God for any church that's preaching the gospel. We may not agree with their methods. They may even be a church that would criticize us or, or look down their nose at us or label us, but that's okay. We rejoice if they're preaching. We ought to be thankful that they're preaching Christ. And we would hope that ultimately they'd be thankful that we're preaching Christ. That's what brings unity to the brotherhood. So the lesson here is focus on what really counts. Focus on what really counts. Now, if I want to be joyful no matter what, the third thing is I need a power to live on. Look at verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, friends, life can, can wear you out. It can drain you completely. Some of you are drained right now. You're ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to throw in the towel on your marriage. You're ready to throw in the towel on your career. You're ready to throw in your towel on your, on your children. You're ready to throw in your towel some of those grumpy people down at church. You're ready to throw in the towel on sharing the gospel because you say, I've done the best I can and it's not been good enough evidently. I'm tired. What you need is a fresh power supply. You know, I remember going uh, on a trip one time and it had been a long trip. I was by myself. I think I was going for a meeting. I can't remember. But I was by myself, and I get to my hotel room, and I just plop down in the chair, throw my luggage over on the, on the bed, and I sit there, and I just thought, I, I've got to relax. I turn on the TV, and it won't come on. I keep clicking, and I go over, and I, t I do everything. I can't get the stupid thing to... Come on. So I call down there and say, look, I've had a hard day. I want some TV in this room. I'm paying for it. And so they send somebody up and they get the remote and then they 
look at the TV and then they walk around and they take the plug and they plug it in the wall. <laughs> I didn't have the power supply. And where do we get that power supply? We have to plug it into the power source, right? If we're going to do what we want to do, we need the power, the energy, the strength to do it. We've got to get that power from the only source. Paul says he gets his power from people who pray for him and from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul's source of strength is right here in verses 19 and 20. The prayers of others and the help of the Spirit. I, I thank God. I, I know I have your prayers. Uh, many of you have told me you pray for me all the time, and I appreciate that. Howard told me, I'm praying for you as you get in the pulpit. I, I appreciate that. I need God's power when I'm speaking to you. I want to present his word in a way that, that, that it touches you. And I just want to be an instrument. I don't want you to go out of here and say, Don, you did a good job. I want you to go out of here and say, Don told me about what God had to say. I heard God today. That's, that's why I need the power of God. You see, we need to have hope in order to cope. If you want to cope with life, you've got to have hope. And where do you get your hope 25 or 30 years ago, Cornell University did a survey of 25,000 POWs from World War II. And what they learned from that was that a man can handle tremendous stress and pressure as long as they have hope. But when they lose hope, the moment the hope is gone, then they're doomed. Where do you get your hope to keep on keeping on? Where do you get your hope to stay true to your marriage? Where do you get that hope in order to hang in there with your kids? Where do you get your hope to keep on going when it seems like that you're not successful in anything you're doing, on the job or sharing your faith or whatever it is? Where do you get your hope? Do you get it from yourself? Is your source reliable? No, you get it from God and from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the source of power, Paul tells us, is in chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, Don, you mean all things? Well, I didn't say this. The Bible tells it. And when it says all things, you mean even that bankruptcy I'm going through? these marriage difficulties I'm going through, these financial problems I'm having, these health problems I'm having, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Where does our strength come from? From Jesus Christ. So the lesson here is with God's power, nothing can devastate me. If I make it in life, I'm going to need a perspective to live from. I need to understand uh, the reality of what is really true. What, what does God see in all of this? I'm going to need a priority to live by, something that will encourage me to always do first things first. And I need a power to live on, something to give me the strength to keep on going. And number four, if I'm going to be joyful no matter what, I need a purpose to live for. Look at verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I, I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to, to, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and, and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul is old. He's tired. He's been in prison 
four, four years. And now he's ready to go to heaven. They've taken away his friends. They've taken away his ministry, his, his freedom, his privacy. But they have not taken away his purpose. Paul was still joyful in spite of all that was taken from him because he had a purpose to live for. And right there in, in verse 21, a very powerful verse. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Either way, Paul was joyous. I have something to do here if I stay, but I'll enjoy the bliss of heaven if I go. He was ready to do either one. He had a purpose. He was living from the standpoint of eternity. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to finish this sentence. For me to live is, you write in the blank what it is. Now, TV ads tell us that, that, that pe people uh, in America are going to fill in the blank a lot of different ways. Uh, some are going to say, for me to live is possessions. Get all you can, can the get, sit on the can and spoil the rest. Possessions. I got to have my stuff, right? Some are going to say, well, for me to live is pleasure, party time. If it feels good, do it. If it's good to you, it must be good for you. I want all the gusto I can get, right? That's what the beer commercials used to say. And some say, well, for me to live is power, is position, it's, it's prestige, it's popularity. I think the primary concern of a lot of people is, what do other people think about me? But you see the problem with possessions and pleasure and power. They don't last. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Look what Paul says. Paul had a long-term goal. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. William James, the philosopher, said, the best use of your life is to invest it in something that will outlast it. Think about that. Invest it in something, invest your life in something that will last even after you lose your life. In other words, I think he's saying, leave a legacy. Leave a legacy of faith. Leave a legacy of hope, of love, of, of integrity. Leave a legacy. Invest your life in something that's going to continue after you die. And one way you can do that is sharing your faith. When you invest it in sharing your faith, sharing the gospel with other people, it's going to live on. My grandmother Mathis was my, my matriarch, my mentor. Her faith still lives on through all of her nine children and all the multitudes of grandchildren and great children. It's going to continue to live on. Invest your life in something that's going to last, that will give you purpose. Have you ever, why does God leave you on earth after you become a Christian? I mean, you're saved. Now we're, we're ready to go to heaven. God saved me. Let's go ahead and go to heaven. Why does he leave us here? Does he leave us here to sin? God forbid. No, he leaves us here to serve other people. That's why we have a purpose. And so here's the lesson. How you finish the above sentence. What you're going to put there. I'm convinced that the reason there's so much unhappiness in our culture is because there's a total preoccupation with self. We live in the me generation. But when you have a greater purpose than just yourself, then you're going to have more joy than you can imagine. 
we have to understand there's just no such thing as problem-free living. It rains on the just and the unjust. And when you place your life on the values that Paul placed his own here in Philippians, then you're going, you and your legacy is going to last. I believe that God wants us to enjoy life. I believe he wants you to enjoy the rest of your life. And then he wants to, you to enjoy your home in heaven at the end. And it all starts right here in Philippians chapter 1 with these foundational values. Let, let's review what those are, those four foundation, foundational values. And I want you to, to put yourself, this is personal now, you, not, not thinking about how they apply to other people, but how do they apply to you? Do you have God's perspective on your problems? Do you have a priority to live by? Do you have a power to live on? And do you have a purpose to live for? And so the question again, for me to live is what? Did you know Christ wants you to put him there? He wants you to write down Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying to you today, complete my joy by enjoying the life that you're living now and leaving a legacy of love and faith. And Jesus is saying to you today, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to Jesus. He will save you. While we stand and sing, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?